to computers um, and everything to do with them until he couldn't use them any longer. I wouldn't call him a saint, uh, but at the same time, who really is a saint? Uh, he had a very quirky sense of humor. Um, there are some of us in this group, in this room right now, that remember a song by heart called Barracuda. And instead of playing it during the day when all of us were awake, he decided to wake us up at the crack of dawn with it blasting at Mach 10. So a little bit of a bizarre sense of humor. Um, and while we were growing up as kids, we would hear of all other kids' punishments. Oh, you know, their parents got mad at them, so they had a month with no TV or two weeks without the car. And we used to wish that's what we'd get. <laughs> Instead, we had in our house what we called death by lecture. <laughs> and uh, two weeks without a TV would have been way easier. <laughs> uh, and I suppose, what can you expect from someone who was a mensin? Language was his life, and he used it often. Uh, but what strikes me the most was how Dad handled his, grace, his Alzheimer's with grace towards the end. Grace isn't a word you would typically use to describe Dad or pretty much anyone, but in this case it just fits. From the moment of his diagnosis, he was fascinated with what was happening to him. I'm not saying that he didn't get frustrated or angry at times, but he always wanted to learn more. He requested the copies of his brain scans so that he could take them home and study them. He took online courses, he bought DVDs about the brain uh, just so he could learn more. He sometimes didn't get to retain that information very long, but he was always very interested in it. Um, he handled his gradual loss of being able to verbally communicate with more grace and goodwill than any of us expected. I'm not even sure I would do half as well as he did. At one point, Scott and I were visiting, and Dad was still able to physically move around with the aid of either the walker or the wheelchair. He finally brought the wheelchair into the kitchen and he was getting ready to say something to mom and nothing came out and he lost it and there's this big long pause as we wait for the words to come and Scott pops up and says, aren't you enjoying those golden years? <laughs> and dad cracked up. Like I hadn't seen him laugh that hard in a long time. It was really funny. When you come right down to it, dad and I had a lot in common. We both have a wacky sense of humor. We're both a little stubborn. And we believe we're right all the time. <laughs> uh, it's just some of the abilities that we share, and it's why none of, neither of us ever really like to apologize. <laughs> I'll just end this by saying that I'll miss you, Dad. I'll miss the walks and the talks and the day-long game, gaming marathons that we'd have with cards. I would say I might miss the lectures, but probably not going to miss those. <laughs> but one more square smile for you, Dad. Love you. <laughs> Anybody else feeling that nudge to come and share a story? Not to be shy. Well, thank you for everybody who shared. And uh, at the luncheon today, please share more of those stories. And I've heard a couple of you, a couple of you came into my office today and shared some Michael stories today. And then you didn't share them up here. So I, don't, I don't remember. <laughs> So 
my prayer this morning is that uh, you hear the promise from Michael's God for you today, but most of all that, that you feel some, some comfort and you feel some presence and love coming from Michael's God for you. Um, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Family, I told you this already, but I'm really sorry. Sue, family, friends, even though he isn't suffering anymore, that does not mean that him not being here doesn't suck. It, it still sucks. It isn't great. You know, and I didn't get a chance to, to deeply get to know Michael a lot, but you know what? I, I love him already, and I, and because I really think, I think I really get Mike. You know, if you haven't seen, if you didn't see the photo back there, <laughs> this guy, this guy, this guy has my sense of humor, right? Like, he, you know, gets a new gravestone, and, uh, and he just goes and lays lays out there after he gets it and sort of like take a picture with his eyes closed. <laughs> maybe he was just, maybe he's like, let me just get this done. We're here, let's finish it up. <laughs> he, I, when I came in, you maybe saw I touched the coffin, right? And one of the things, the reason I did that, it was I heard a story and I heard a rumor, and maybe this rumor that he really, really wanted a, a, a special kind of coffin that when you touched it, Recordings of him saying various naughty things. <laughs> but perhaps I want. I just wanted to know. He never, he never did it. He wanted you wanted it, right? So maybe you should touch the coffin, <laughs> and just to make sure. And if you haven't looked at that photo, then then you're really, really missing out, right? I. <laughs> this is just hilarious, and we're gonna miss someone who's brilliant. And, and funny from this world. Speaking of posters, yesterday as Sue and Clan were here setting up all of these posters and, and things, uh, I heard them joking about being a weird family. Uh, I, I think that's right. I think that's what I heard. And, 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 and I heard you guys say it again today, so I know I heard that right. Well, not surprising. This dude right here was weird. <laughs> I heard a story that involved a pool and a car without air conditioning, and I'm going to tell it. Michael was driving in his car and apparently had no air conditioning, and it was a super, super hot day. So what do you do when you get home, when you, after you've been in a hot car for however long? Well, he gets up his driveway, he opens his door, bolts out the car, and jumps headfirst into the above-ground pool. I think they thought he knocked himself out, but, uh, but he was fine. And of course, why did he do that? Well, because it was hot. And what an amazing way to cool down. I love him. Look, we know he was funny. But there's two more things that stand out to me about Mike. The first was that he had a first-rate intelligence. You know, that kind of intelligence where you can hold two conflicting ideas in there at the same time. I'll talk more about that in a second. And at second, it seems to me that Michael was the kind of person that you would know what he was thinking or feeling or processing because he'd let you know. You know, we heard it today, we heard about the death by lecture, right? They would get into trouble and their big punishment would be death by lecture. And he would talk and talk and talk and talk <laughs> and talk at you until you couldn't stand it. And then he would talk some more. And as he was talking, he talked so much that he would actually come around to your uh, way of thinking, but you were still punished, and thus you were still wrong. Again, holding two conflicting ideas. This guy talks so much, apparently, or could talk so much, that we almost picked a scripture for this morning that talked about how God talks to, too much to God's people, but we, we held off. He knew... He, he, knew that he, found what, he knew what he found amusing and what bothered him. And yes, that means with Michael, it was either the best moment or a pretty challenging moment. But that was the least, least, you, least you knew. It was a little transparent. You've said it today already, family, but you know he wasn't perfect, but please don't forget how much he loved you. 
growing up, he had to move all the time and moving from home to home, place to place, and he didn't want that for you. So once you all got here, you stayed here. And think about those times that either bought you a bike because he didn't want you to be left out or that, or that dream trip that took place that is, that is closest to the Garden of Eden that we have here on Earth or any of all those other special moments, the ones that I don't know about, the ones that are in your heart and you know. He loved you. And yes, he tried to learn a bunch of instruments and then he would drop them. But I think, I think this was an act of love. And I'll tell you why. Maybe he was saving you from the pain of having to hear, you know, uh, hear him play bang on the drum all day on a flute or a piano or a harmonica or a bongo during a Packer game. It'd be a touchdown and you, you, just, you just don't know, right, what he'd be doing. But let's be honest. Life was hard for him, too. He had, I like to call it a demon, he had a demon of bipolar depression tormenting him. And then at the end, there was that pseudo Parkinson's and that loss of words, losing one word at a time that came with that really rare type of Alzheimer's he had. And without his words went his lectures and his jokes, and that first-rate intelligence seemed to be fading away. It wasn't. It was just getting locked in there. Sad. It was hard for you too, especially the last year and a half, and even more so in the last six months. It weighed on you. And whether it was mood or his movement or his words, it was hard. I said this already today, but I don't know about all of you, but I, for one, am so tired of death taking the funniest and wittiest and the most transparent of us from this world. This world's already tough enough as it is. Here's the thing, there's some good news here. There's good news for Mike, and I hope, that, I hope that is also good news for you. Mike's good news is also good news. We heard this morning from Mike's God, his God said, that through, the pro- said through the prophet that the hurting and the captive will, be re- will rebuild the ancient ruins. That means for Michael, where in this hard world he was attacked and scourged by the scourge of depression, when, he, when he's with Jesus, all of that is healed and he is safe. That means that where in this tough place he lost the ability to move. When he is with Jesus, he can move and lay down anywhere and take a nap wherever he wants. <laughs> I wonder if they have graveyards up, up, up there in heaven. If they do, you know where he is. That means that where in this difficult world he, where he was slowly being locked in as he lost word by word, with Jesus, each word is being returned to him. Certainly the words that praise his God, but also maybe the naughty ones too. I learned that after 9-11, he decided he was going to fly because he wasn't going to let you know, some terrorists stop him from getting in a plane. I'm not sure that was the exact words, but he decided <laughs> for getting on a plane, but even though he never was interested in flying before. That's really interesting, because you know what? There was a time long ago where Michael here was not a fan of faith or church or religion, but that did not stop God's spirit from finding him and bringing him here to the Coral Lutheran Church and giving him a faith and giving him a church and giving him a religion. And so if God's spirit will do that, my friends, then you know that God's son Jesus will come for him at the end, and even now, Michael's with his savior Jesus. That is a promise. Amen, amen. Now, I'd usually end there because the promise of Michael's God and Savior Jesus is everything. At least for us Jesus people it is. But I actually have one more story. At one point, Michael built a greenhouse and after he was done, starting, I guess, a garden or whatever in there, he left it for Sue. to to (laughs) And apparently... After meeting Sue in college and hitting it off with her, it it took Sue getting her number to him and then a whole week before he sort of finished that love connection and made the phone call, right? Glad he did. But man, and I I know all of you are glad he did because different people here, I guess. And Sue made the joke to me once that he did his part to bring amazing children to this world but then left Sue to raise them. I don't know, I get the sense that sometimes he started stuff and then left other people to finish it. (laughs) You 
see, his life worked because there were people who would do that for him, who loved him enough to do that for him. This, Sue, I really want you to hear this. Sue, you and Michael built a life together, and he certainly did his part, certainly did. But he's left you to finish that life. That means even at the end, even with all the Alzheimer's, you could count on him just to be him. He was there. And of course you will finish that life. We can't help it. We just sort of go until we're done. That can't be helped. But the question is, will you finish it with fun and humor and weirdness? <laughs> See, Michael and Jesus are all wherever being weird together. And my gut tells me <laughs> they both want you to have all the fun and all the strangers that you missed out in the last year and a half or more. They want that for you. So please, let it be so soon. Amen. Let's go ahead and sing Amazing Grace. <clears throat> Before we go on with, with our service, I, in this world, this beautiful world, there are many people that are in many different places within their faith life and their journey and, and what, they, what they believe. And so we are going to ask you, these words that I have are, are, are Jesus, he, God words, and that's the best I got, and that's the best a lot of us here at Decorah have. But wherever you are, we're still going to invite you to rise, and if you can participate and say these words with us, then that's beautiful if you're moved to do that, and if not, um, please just join us in, in silent respect. I invite you to rise. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he went on to judge the living and the dead. 
play either one that you want. Uh, if I only do one or the other, I get yelled at after after so I did it wrong for somebody. So pick yours. <laughs> Our Father. Into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Michael Poznanski. We humbly ask that you acknowledge this sheep of your own fold, this lamb of your own flock, and this sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of all your saints who live in light. Uh, so, immediately after this service, friends, we will be traveling to Coral Lutheran Cemetery for the committal, and there's going to be a little more service there. And after the committal, there will be a luncheon served in the fellowship hall. And again, during the luncheon, please share all your stories about Michael with each other. So, let us pray. In the name of Jesus, I ask God to bless the food that we are going to eat. I ask God to bless the team that put together the lunch. I ask God to bless... Most of all, our time together and our time of mourning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So during the recessional song, which will be next, the pall will be moved, and then uh, Michael will go, and then the family will follow Michael, and then you guys can follow the family. Uh, let us all please go in peace. <coughs>